1420 not live for a Tuesday. It is the 17th of May. And uh, a, a strange, a strange email to wake up to today, Phil, because one of the most important figures in the modern day history of rugby league, and I don't think that's hyperbole at all, has, has died in Morris Lindsay. And, and I thought a, a divisive figure at times. I, I'm surprised there wasn't more divisive comment about him on social media today, but people have been behaving. Certainly reshaped Wigan, certainly reshaped the game as a whole as we know it. What kind of dealings did you have with him, Phil? I, I think anybody that's been involved in the sport would want to come across Morris. Um, he knew how to handle the media. He knew what the media wanted. Um, he knew a great story when he could see it. He knew how to put himself at the centre of that great story. Um, I don't think there'll have been anybody involved in the media who hasn't had a run-in with him, but it wasn't forgotten the minute you'd had it. Um, he was that type of a character. He, you know, the epitome of a benevolent dictator in many ways. Um, and there are times, I think, you know, when someone who is visionary, which is a word that's been used a lot to describe, who is clearly a leader, um, I think the, some of his, of his detractors would say um, a non-delegator, um, which obviously made working for him, for some people, difficult. I saw, I saw a quote from Harry Gration, who we all know um, wasn't at the RFL for very long under Morris, saying that when Morris went on one of his trips to Australia, nothing happened because nothing could happen because Morris was the man who was in charge of everything. So when he wasn't there... Uh, it, it was very hard to, to stand in for him. He, he, he was a showman um, and he knew what sold. So I think, you know, there, are, there will be legendary stories told about him now. Um, certainly Dave Woods tells one of when he was a young up-and-coming journalist at a, a, a sports agency in Wigan and it, his job was to uh, ring and get a story from Wigan every day. And if Morris didn't like it, he'd be on the phone the next day making a teenage Dave Wood's life hell. And then the next minute he'd be ringing up going, Dave, Dave, I need you to do a favour. I need this story to go out. And, and that's the way Morris was. He, he was fantastic at not only manipulating the media to his advantage, but knowing what they wanted. Um, and he, he did used to entertain all of the sports editors. He, you know, and he did put rugby league front and centre. And you know, the legendary story of him getting Diana Ross to open the 1995 World Cup, which he was in charge of again, against all of the advice he was given by everyone he worked with and the Rugby League Council who said, don't do it, don't spend such a vast amount of money on something that is nothing to do with Rugby League. And of course, you know, all of the national newspapers were full of Diana Ross coming over and driving around Wembley and half singing a song and being on Concord and home before the game had, had finished. But that didn't matter because Morris knew how to uh, manipulate the media. You know, the, the Paris... Um, kickoff of Super League, where everybody said this will be a disaster. You know, somehow Morris, it, it wasn't Morris alone, but 17,000 people turned up to that game and it looked brilliant on television. And he just had the ability to do that. He wasn't afraid to be unpopular. I think, you know, a, a lot of the administrations we've seen, it's been, uh, you know, if they object to something, we need to find a compromise that brings them in. And, uh, you know, if, if, if I'm upsetting that person, then I can't be seen to be showing favour to that person. Mor Morris had an idea of how it should be and he didn't care who we upset and he didn't mind going into a room and saying, call me whatever you want, but this is how it's going to be. And and I, I, I do think that sometimes we, we do miss that. And uh, yes, I'm all for you know consultation and and and, you know, having the majority thinking the same way, but, but Morris's way was Morris's way. And he defended the sport a lot. Um, clearly he, th there is a, there is a, a tale of him uh, when rugby union went professional in 95, st having a lunch, staging a lunch with all the big wigs of rugby union and coming out afterwards and saying, Oh, well, there'll be a time when uh, there may only be one code of rugby, but you know, we'll start it on our terms. And, uh, We'll get the ball rolling and we'll tell them exactly what's wrong with their game and we'll tell them why they should adopt the things from our game. And it, I, I don't know, he, he, he just was a forthright advocate for rugby league. Um, he had a genuine passion for it. And he was one of these people that when he was in the room, you knew he was the centre of attention. Um, I thought the last time I spoke to him in any great depth, um, I think we did a, a 
a long interview for the magazine, which was spread over two issues. And that was at a time when he, he, he wasn't quite as mobile, um, which became an, an, an issue for him for being seen in public and getting to games and all that kind of thing. But even speaking to him, his passion didn't leave him. And, and, I, and I think, again, Brian Carney has, has said it in his tribute on, on Sky today. He, not only was he a people person, but he was a players person. He realised that whilst he had a profile as an administrator, what people really wanted to see and hear was the players. They want, you know, and it is no coincidence that we still talk about, and in, in some ways, you know, a, a, a relatively sad that it it is Martin Afire and Ellery Hanley that people still remember. Well, that's a lot of that's down to Morris and you know Sean Edwards again paying fulsome tribute in the the Daily Mirror to him today that you know he, he still kept in touch with him and every time he ended a phone call and I think he says the last time he spoke to him was about a month ago. He just told him how grateful he was for for what he'd done for Sean. And and I, I think, again, putting those players front and centre was everything for him. Um, I, yeah, clearly, he was not built to play the game. He, I, I gather he was a boxer in his younger days, but he wasn't built to play rugby league. He, he was closer to being a jockey and, and clearly had a huge passion as well for horse racing. Um, but he could never have played rugby league, but I think he so admired the people that did that when he got into a position at Wigan where he could start accruing the finest talent in the world, then he was going to let them do the talking. And uh, so the, the the evidence of that is that those players of that era still are on the tip of a lot of people's tongue. I mean, I described him on the programme a couple of years ago as Rugby League's Margaret Thatcher in terms of he would make unpopular decisions for what he thought was best for in, the, in our sense the game. Obviously, I never spoke to him or dealt with him, but he was a ma- massive figure in the sport as a supporter because he was always doing something. And I go back to the mid-90s, and without him at the helm, would we be playing in the summer and would there be a thing called Super League? We probably would be playing in the summer because I think there was a move from a working party that had already been set up that was going to involve Jim Quinn at Old and Gary Hetherington. Um, and I think that their resolution was going to be passed. I, I don't think... Super League was contingent upon moving to summer. I think summer was happening and, and Super League said, well, actually, that would suit us because uh, we won't be in direct competition with another sport that we're putting a lot of money into at the moment. Um, but no, I, th- I think, the again, it, we shouldn't forget he was a very shrewd businessman um, and he, he, some of those principles he, he bought into sport. So if you want to get something through that is contentious, then give something that's completely unpalatable and the untentious slips in underneath it. So I, I, I don't think we would have... Anybody else negotiating the deal with Rupert Murdoch and his Sky Empire would not have got the level of money that Morris did. The the game of poker that he played, the bravard... I mean, they offered something like 70-odd million pounds to start with. And there aren't many people with the state that Rugby League was in at that time, particularly financially, that would have said, don't take the first offer. Let's go back and make a case for saying, actually, we want 87 million. And that's what he got. He got an extra, you know, 10, 11 million on the back of he knew how to negotiate. He knew when the cards were stacked in his favour and he knew when he could almost hold his his other uh, half of the negotiations to ransom a little bit because they needed British Super League to undermine what was happening in Australia because that meant there was an international game. Um, he was an expansionist and clearly uh, there'll be loads of quotes of when Super League starts, we'll be playing in Barcelona and Paris and Madrid. And, uh, and But that, uh, you know, in his mind, that was what Super League meant. Um, I, I don't think there was anything uh, bravado about that other than how was it going to happen? I think that's genuinely how he saw the game. I think it was important at the time, particularly the 95 World Cup and then leading into another one in 2000 and whether that was successful or not. I think he said, you know, it's not just about having one. There's got to be, we've got to decide we're having another one on the back of it. Um, he, he was uh, chair of the International Federation because it was the RFL's turn while he was in office. And I think, again, you know, we, we look at some of the, the games at Wembley between Great Britain and Australia, Great Britain and New Zealand in, in the time that he was involved, the tour in 92, which, you know, although Gar- Gary Schofield still blames him for never getting his 50th cap, he would a- acknowledge that that tour in 92 was the highlight of his career. That that test match in Melbourne will never be forgotten. And, and again, I just think that because he had that outlook on, if I love this game, everybody should love this game. A bit like, you know, Carsten. 
who uh, who we'll be talking to. And, you know, he, he is an evangelist and he's come to the game knowing nothing about it. Um, and, and he's just seen it for what it is and said, well, you might have had it for 120 odd years, but there's no reason why I can't like it. And this is what I like about it. Well, I think Morris was the same. You know, if this game is so good, why can we not sell it to a, a wider, more commercial audience? And um, we love characters, don't we? And the media love characters. Don't, the media love dealing with him because you just never got a straight yes or no answer. You, 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 you know, you, you got his answer. You got his explanation. He told you where you were wrong. Um, as he as he did me on a couple of occasions, and um, whether he was right or not, he, he felt that you know something that he'd seen or um, something that he hadn't been asked about. Um, he, I think he often felt that he was a he was a major player in history, so that when the history of the time he was there was being written, if he wasn't asked, then he felt that you should have asked him. Yeah, how can you know what's happened if you don't come to me and ask me? And and in some ways that that summed him up a little bit, but. Uh, but he did things, and it and he got the the game spoken about to a wider audience, and we haven't really got that anymore. And I mean, would it be fair to say, I mean, after the two thousand World Cup, which we all just decide now is a complete farce and disaster, and whatever, and whatever word you want to use, that's not disaster is the wrong word, but you know what I mean. It, financially, it, it was a disaster. Saved international rugby league in two thousand one when the Aussies weren't going to come over because they thought the Eiffel Tower was in London. Yeah. And again, there are some people who need on a phone that will tell that tell it the way it is. Tell them why they're being ridiculous to not come, but also have that um, almost aura about them that if you say it's all right and you're guaranteeing this and that, will come. Um, so yeah, he did a massively important figure. Um, you know, people forget, other than some Wigan fans of a certain age that when he was invited to be this four at Wigan um, that came and saved the club, the big four, they'd been relegated. You know, they could not have been any lower. Um, and he went from being relegated in 1980 to building them into an absolute powerhouse by the mid to end of that decade. Um, that, that is a massive feat. Um, I, I suspect there'll there'll be more tributes to come. I, I I would imagine that Ellery will say something in the next day or two. And uh, the the measure of the man is is the tributes that he gets. And uh, they will forget that Central Park had to be sold to pay for it all. And they 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 will forget that the second spell at Wigan um, again hovered dangerously around relegation for a little time, and that there was a little easing of the salary cap to make sure that they didn't and. You know, he, I, I don't think he was particularly successful at, at Preston when he went there. I, I again didn't follow his his football career, but um, you know, when they talk about administrators like Eddie Waring, like maybe Harry Sunderland, um, you know, th they will talk about Maurice Lindsay. Um, he was that bigger figure. I think he was on back chat a few years ago, wasn't he? And it, and he, you could still see that he always had that sparkle in his eye when you saw him on TV and. He was always someone who had something to say and you would listen to what he had to say. Even if you didn't agree with what he was saying, you listened to what he was saying. And I, think I, was, I think I was on with him that episode as well. Um, and, and again, what I really liked about him, and it's the same with people like Tony Smith and Brian McDermott, you can't say anything without being able to justify it. So if you come out with a, an opinion, however trite it may be, Morris was the kind of bloke who was, well, why do you say that? that? That's nonsense. Um, I'll tell you why it's nonsense. And then you tell me why you still think it was a good idea. And that kind of debate is stimulating for anyone who's involved in it. Uh, you, you know that you can't just say, oh, well, we need to spend £10 million to do this. And you go, right, where's the £10 million coming from? Uh, he, he, he was very forthright in his views, but he could back them up. And uh, he challenged you to say, right, well, if you're taking a contrary position, or you're coming up with a suggestion, you've got to justify how you're actually going to make that happen. One of a kind, that kind of thing, all those kind of um, cliched things to say, broke them all, blah, 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 blah. Um, I, I, I wonder, leaving the tribute bit aside, had he been in charge of the Rugby Football League last year when we had the, the um, academy nonsense, you get the feeling he wouldn't have rolled back on that kind of thing because he made his no. decision and that, that was it, yeah. That's absolutely it. That Once he made a decision, then nothing was going to 
uh, make him turn around and, and change his mind because he genuinely felt that every decision he made was in the interest of the game. So nobody was going to tell him that he hadn't made it for that reason. So he didn't need to change his mind. I also think that we're in a period now where we're deciding what the terms of this IMG deal will be. And, and it could be uh, you know, incredibly significant for the sport. We won't know until uh, maybe three or four years down the line. And we've seen the evidence of what it is and what it may bring. But I still feel that having a Morris in your corner negotiating exactly how that's going to work and what return you're going to get from it more than anything else, um, we, we do miss that. I mean, it was going to be interesting to, as you say, over the coming days, there'll be more and more stories about how he ran things at club and, well, governing body level. And it'd be interesting to see, be interesting to read the stories because, you know, characters, as you say, whether they're on the field or off the field, we prefer them to be on the field, but sometimes, as you say, the Eddie Waring's, the Morris Lindsay of this world, they are worth remembering. And uh, it, it's, not something for this podcast, maybe the hypothetic podcast in Australia. What would what would rugby league in this country be if Morris Lindsay had never gone to Wigan? There's a there's a big topic for someone to discuss. I don't know. I'm sure later in the year, like when we discuss the the legacy of Dave Hadfield, we, we can spend some more time reflecting on on Morris Lindsay's legacy to the game. Though I think we've said plenty there for people to think about, and I'm sure there'll be people who who aren't fans of him and, and aren't buying into the, the eulogies today because their clubs weren't favoured by him in the way the sport was shaken up. But, but I, I don't think he saw it that way. And again, it's very hard to speak for him and particularly now. But, you know, having asked him a, a little bit about the merger situation and, and you know, having regrets and I didn't know, he, you know, at the time he said, you know, that's what the sport was was that the road the sport needed to head down and clearly there were going to be people who were disenfranchised but because he was the character that he was he was at least prepared to have that debate and he would say that he did negotiate a couple of those mergers that you know there were a couple of clubs that that did agree and it was only when they went back and thought I don't think we can sell this that they came back and said we're not going to do it not that the idea is wrong and 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 again hindsight being a wonderful thing there are different ways of coming to maybe affect something like that um but i do think he you know we're still talking about the kind of things he was talking about framing the future is still as big a document that you know he was he was a a major author of um we, we're still saying actually you know there's merit in all of this and we need to go back and revisit it and all that kind of thing and i think he'd be delighted that to lose her in super league he, he if he was in charge of the game he definitely would be looking at a three-year moratorium on relegation for them and it, his justification would be well if you did that for castellan what are we even talking about it for it's got to happen and it will happen and if you ever want a, a commercial reality out of the french game then don't get them relegated in the first year and and that's the kind of i'm sure that's the sort of stance he would have taken and the kind of debate he would have had and um, he would he would have loved two French teams in Super League. In fact, he would have loved to have just decamped to the south of France for probably a month and watched three or four of their home games, maybe with Wigan coming over, um, staying at Sean Edwards' house near Collier. Um, he, he'd have loved it. He'd have loved it. And uh, I, I think we'll miss him. They might not get relegated yet, Phil. But I don't no. want to talk about that. Um <laughs> Oh. We'll talk about mergers in a bit because I, I need to go back to an old subject when we talk about the Women's Super League. Uh, Super League this week, uh, Catalans beat Warrington 40 points to eight. I was before, you know, we were going to do this program, and before this morning's news, I was thinking we can talk about Warrington in crisis, we can talk about Wakefield. <laughs> I, I, I don't really, we can save that for another week because there's not really much more to say, and nothing will change. Warrington lost a game, they were expected to lose. Now, maybe not in the fashion they did. By and, 40 and, points they, to eight, but even yeah, then. it was that was a funny one because mm. for the bulk of that game they were very competitive, and at the end they completely and utterly fell away. Um, which, which you know, I, I think they've got St Helens this week, which is going to be an equally difficult game for them. So, yeah, I think if we if we have this debate after Leeds have played Wakefield, we'll probably still be talking about the same things. Yeah, um, I you know. I, I apologise. I tipped Leeds to win, and obviously they got hammered by by Salford, who haven't been great recently. No, but um, Brody Croft was absolutely magnificent. Tall leads apart. Um, one of one of the great 
uh, one of the the standoff performances that you pay money to go and watch dictated the game. Uh, nobody knew whether he was going to run with the ball, pass or kick, and you just watched him um, just take charge. And, and when he had people like Callum Watkins alongside him, uh, defending the, the way he did. Um, now, Salford were great, and if they can keep all their top-line players on the field for long enough, they'll be fine. The, the concern is the same as it's always been, that you lose three or four of them um, that are their top-line first-choice players, and it won't be the same. Harvey Levet was magnificent in his first game of the season. He's always a player who you think perhaps could have been more than he has been. And perhaps he still will be. But uh, hopefully he can be at, at Salford uh, going forward. Um, Saints beat Hull. That was just a game on the telly. Just Saints, Saints have so, obviously got their so issues, haven't they? That's the problem. So professional. You know, to yeah. come back from the disappointment of that Challenge Cup defeat and um, uh, just so difficult to, to break down. Um and again, that's that was without a couple of their top line players. I, I thought they were magnificent. Um, I'm not surprised in the way they they played in the last three or four years. Um, whole KR's an interesting case in point at the moment. Um, well, the wheels have obviously come off because Tony Smith announced he's leaving. Even though everyone knows Christian Wolf's probably going to leave Saints at the end of the season, that's not affected them. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm just I, speculating. There. Well, well, interesting that there has been a coaching casualty in the NRL today with uh, Trent Barrett losing his job at I mean, which, Canterbury. Which, which job's Trent Barrett going to get in Super League then? Because obviously he's the favourite now for every single job going. But interesting that even the people in Australia have put Christian Wolfe's name as one of the people who might be called upon to say that. I, th- I think it's safe to say that there will be an NRL job for him next year um, if he wants one, and I, I, I think he will. Um but I, I don't know what's happened to Hulk You know, that they win, what, six in a row and they're going into a semi-final and everything's great and they're, they're playing lovely rugby. They're, they're, you know, on the verge of the top four. And then in three weeks, they've scored one try. And now their fans are saying, we're in crisis. Um, tough game for them at home to Catalan on Channel 4 on Saturday. Um, I think they want to showcase themselves. Again, talking to... Tony Smith about that before all of this blew up. You know, he said that that Channel 4 game was a real opportunity for them to show what they're about to a new nationwide audience and uh, their flamboyance with which they play on the field and the great work that they're doing with Craven Street off the field. Um, But I think that mood has changed over the last three weeks. And um, clearly, we do know that there won't be many opposition fans there um, because it's Catalan. It'd be very interesting to see if it's a sombre and subdued Craven Park, or if it will come alive for the for the television cameras. I think we're just glad, without going into it, that Leeds aren't on the telly on Channel Four after you know the Salford fans at the weekend. But but again, I I this is what it is. I I suspect that is going to happen everywhere Leeds play, um, and if it's done in black humour, then. There's a place for it. It's when it becomes, if it becomes offensive, which I don't think it did at Salford. Um, I, I think they, they trod the line. Um, and clearly, if you're going to play fullback, you're going to be very close to those fans <laughs> at some point in the game. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that, that there's always... There's always, always something looking, going on, isn't there? There's always well, you're always looking to try and get something over your opponents. And, and the fans' way of doing that is to... Uh, use any extraneous influence they can uh, to make up a chant um, with, with which to undermine the the guys that are in front of them. And, and I'm not saying that the uh, the Western end at uh, Headingley won't be doing that on, on Friday night. But, I'm uh, sure they will. I'm, I'm sure, sure they will be. I'm probably saying, oh, we should have kept Ryan Hampshire because he played for Cass at the weekend. So, you know. uh, and wait if you lost to, to, to lose 20 points to 14 in a game which you couldn't hear or see or do anything with. Uh, Although when the um, when the feed came in for the Super League show, it was really good. So who was filming it? I I, I mean we mentioned this with Carson just to prove that we spoke to him already. I, I can pay I can pay a fiver. Why am I running out of time? There's only two of us. I shouldn't do that. Um, that's true, me. Um, I can pay a fiver this week to see Lee and Workington, which I don't think anyone outside of Lee possibly. Wants. Why is he always Lee? By the way. Because I think that I think they give permission, but the thing about that is, it's the team at the bottom of the table against yeah. 
team that is, you know, very much towards the top of the table. And on, on what, what I saw at Batley last night, who, um, you know, are a side that are, that are in and around the playoffs, I, I, I'm not even sure that's going to be... Uh, but it'd be interesting because we're, we're going to watch Wigan, Huddersfield, Featherstone and Lee a week out before they go to Spurs. So will they pick their first choice team? Will there be any hesitancy in trying to, you know, not get injured and miss out on a major occasion? Will their minds psychologically, understandably be thinking about a bigger picture of the following week? I don't know. It may well be it's a, it's a very good week for Workington to play Lee. And, um, you know, we'll be surprised about how competitive that game is. But on the basis of last night in Batley, um, I think you mainly would be a, a Lee or a Workington fan if you were going to pay a fine. And they've got 7 billion players anyway. So their, their second is probably good. The most expensive water boy in rugby league. The, the new Gary Mercer. Um Huddersfield and Wigan, we learned nothing from in Super League because it wasn't the first choice teams. So, which is understandable. Yeah, well done Huddersfield, well done Wigan's kids, who all had a go. So a bit like a bit like Saints at Cast the other week. Uh, in the Championship, Barrow beat Workington, uh, York beat Bradford on the Percy Stamford Odsall. Dewsbury yeah. lost to Fenton. Few, few complaints there from James Ford about the state of the pitch. Um, Can't go on. Maybe the RFL should have a word with the owner. I don't know. Um, Halifax beat Sheffield. London lost to Newcastle on Friday nights. And Witness beat Whitehaven. So Witness have bounced back. That's um, a great result for Witness because, yeah. again, we were told turmoil, coach leaving, club in disarray. Um, win by 40 points. 16. That, that's, a, that's, a, that's a big win. Um, North Wales beat Oldham. They remain unbeaten. Well done, North Wales. London Scholars lost to Doncaster, 44-12. It was close at half-time. Um, that seems to be a motto at the minute, doesn't it? Uh, Keithley beat Rochdale, 40 points to 16. That was close at half-time. Um, Swinton went away at Hunslet. And West Wales, congratulations to them. First win of the season. Uh, they beat Cornwall, 20 points to nil. I was going to watch it on, on Sunday afternoon, uh, but it was on at the same time as A, the women's game, and B, I was tired, I just fell asleep. Because I've been working nights on the weekend, so it was a bit... No, I, do I want to watch this? No, I don't. Big positive for Cornwall, 1,150. A really good crowd. Um, big negative, zero. Yeah, and I do like how the, there's a letter in the League Express today saying, oh, yeah, this, kick them out. And they've only played seven games. We've well, played seven games. We want to expand. We can't contract. They're off the bottom anyway. <laughs> uh, congratulations to Leeds and uh, Catalans who are in the wheelchair Challenge Cup final on June 25th in Ull, where they played the uh, round-robin stage of the competition this week. Hell of a festival, it was, I'm told. Went brilliantly organised, lots of teams involved, everybody got something out of it, and uh, fantastic that Catalan had come over for the first time to be part of it and made the final, and and that helps build up the England-France mm. wheelchair international as well. Um, in the trophy, Gravesend Dynamite will meet Mersey Storm. I assume that's on the same day as the, the Challenge Cup final. I've done that. Though. You'd hope so. Yeah. Oh, it will be. Yes. Double it's yep. an enthralling double header, it says in the paper. Excellent. And in, in the Women's Super League, I'm, I'm zooming through this because I don't know why I'm, I'm calling it. Oh, by the way, everyone made a big deal about who was in the Academy Origin teams and then it wasn't broadcast anywhere. So can we make up our mind what we're doing? We've got school ga- schoolboys games on one week. We've got mm-hmm. NCL on here. We've got Cornwall sometimes. We can pay to watch Lee. But we make a big deal out of, oh, we've got four academy players in the Yorkshire and Lancashire Academy. It's not broadcast anywhere. What's the point? Exactly. Well, it's a three-match series. Let's hope that the other two are. I mean, I'm not saying I would have watched it, but we don't seem to have a plan. We showed the Oxford University game. We showed teachers against... I, I don't know what we're doing. I don't know what we're doing. Um, in the Women's Super League, Wigan lost to St. Helens 44-0 which was exactly as you'd expect, 28-0 to Saints at half-time. Um, they sometimes, and this is my only criticism of St. Helens, and I've mentioned this before, so it's not as if I'm saying something new. I think they get bored sometimes and try to overplay things when they when they haven't got a challenge in front of them. Their defence is so good, they know the yeah. opposition isn't going to score against them, so they may as well have a bit of fun on attack. But as you say, you can't do that when you play Australia in the World Cup. Um. York beat Huddersfield 50 points to six. 
Um, Huddersfield had managed to sign a player from Wakefield, which I didn't know about, which is interesting. Oh, okay. No, no, you that was played in somebody's back garden, though, wasn't it? It, it looked like it, didn't it? Which, you know, for an elite sport, and I, I know it's, this is... Hull Cow and Hull FC are in the Championship or League One, I don't know, but they played their game at Craven Park. I know Huddersfield, it's difficult for them to play at the John Smith Stadium, but there must be somewhere else they can play. There must be another ground, rugby league ground in the area they could use that looks better. No disrespect to the ground itself. I know Wigan are going to have the same issue. Well, Robin Park, I guess, is, is all right, isn't it? It's, it's an actual venue. Um, Barrow lost to Warrington, 32-6 in Group 2. Lee minus Rings beat Wakefield, 28-14. Bradford lost to Featherston, 30 points to nil. I'm fully in favour, by the way, because Cass didn't play this week. I think they play this week, don't they, against Featherston. As I said before, Featherston, Cassford and Wakefield should merge. The women's game is a perfect opportunity like wheelchair, to rip things up and do things differently. There's no reason why you can't do that. I mean, Fenton would probably say, well, we don't need to because our team's decent. But Fenton and Bradford was a battle between the two teams who were in the first Women's Super League Grand Final. It was, yeah. Um, when Women's Rugby League was rebranded and everything. And, and there they are in, in Division 2 and Bradford didn't score a point. So it's it's amazing how quickly things have changed this week Leeds play Huddersfield on Friday double header time, before the yeah, night I'm going I'm going I'll go then if you're I've going got, I'll go I've already got I mean I'm hoping I get to speak to Lois after the game because I've got a question for her uh, which, which is not one of those gotcha questions but it's an, it's an interesting question I'm going to ask her but, is uh, Hannah Butcher Sid Hines in disguise is that the question <laughs> she's going to get sent off in, get sent off in the cup final who is uh, St Helen's answer to Alex Murphy? Is there one in that in that women's? Well, there probably, there probably is actually, but I'm not going to name them on there. Uh, and there's some other games this week um, on Sunday: York versus St Helen's, which will be great. I don't think that's being televised, is it? So, well, that would make sense. Bearing in mind that that is one of the few games that has something riding on it. And they go on our league. They could have gone instead of doing league. They could have put the York Halifax game. I think it is before, which should be a decent game. Three one. I'm going to get told off again. Bradford versus Lee Miners Rangers, Fev Cass and Warrington versus Wakefield, which has been played at the Halliwell Jones. So well done to Warrington. I think it's a double header with the reserves. And, and, yes, and it is. While we're running out of time, the reserves. What's the point of the reserves when Leeds have half a team from Featherston and Hunslow? There is that's no. Not, that's no knock on. I'm not knocking Leeds there. I'm just saying, what, what's the point? We said um, when we heard it was coming back that it's coming back too early, that there isn't the pool of players there to justify having a reserve league. This is out now. It is the current it issue is. of 40, 20 magazine. I thought I recognised it. I've written some words. And I'm yeah. really annoyed at the BBC. Don't, oh, oh, I can't if believe. They, if they were going to do it any week, it would have to be this week, wouldn't it? I spent hours. It, do, it doesn't alter your statistical player. analysis. No. I, I but typical. Triathlon. Triath- modern pentathlon. I've not watched it yet. I'm going to have to watch it to review it, but I don't want to watch it because it's crap. Apparently it wasn't very good. No. This programme is not very good. But coming up now is Germany's favourite son. No, he's not Tom Johnston. It's, yeah. it's Carsten, who's been in the UK. So we've been speaking to him. Uh, we'll be back next week, live on Thursday, I think. Um, might plan something before then. I don't know. but probably save it till after Spurs. Uh, so enjoy Carsten. We'll see you next week. Buy the magazine. And uh, yeah, enjoy, enjoy Rugby League. Yet another person who is foreign and is uh, still watching rugby league uh, despite all the barriers put in front of him. You can't watch it on Twitter anyway. Carsten, what, what are you what are you doing over here? What's what's happening? Oh, I have my annual trip to some games and meeting some friends who are found through rugby league. How, how did you get involved in rugby league in the first place? Because I, I, I imagine it's not very big in Switzerland. No, it isn't. <laughs> Uh, my sister uh, migrated to Australia, to Townsville, and my today brother-in-law took me to a game, and I saw this little guy with a padded uh, helmet play, which was JT, and I fell in love with the game. Not, not a bad person to, to, to watch. I mean, he, he wasn't a bad player, was he? No, he wasn't. <laughs> Better than average, I would say. <laughs> 
not a bad time to be watching the uh, the Cowboys with the team that they have. But again, you are the perfect example of evangelism, that you come to a sport that you don't really know. You actually see it for what it is rather than the politics that might surround it and the, the history. And presumably it's people like you that we need to appeal to moving forward. Uh, honestly, every new fan is something the sport has to appeal to. Because when I look around at the games, uh, the fans are dying out, getting older and older. So new fans are needed and new fans in um, non-traditional areas are needed. I think the NRL now with, an, with, with the games on a German pay TV channel is a little step, but it's behind the paywall. And who pays for a sport which he say don't know? So your heritage is German. Um, you're yes. probably wearing a German shirt as we speak. Um, I am. And that somehow has got you passionate about uh, third and fourth tier nations that are playing the sport. So not only yeah. do you have one that you can support, which is clearly rebuilding and, and you know, the, the sad passing of Simon Cooper, who we paid tribute to on this programme, I think has set them back a bit, but but clearly Andy Hay is living there now and is involved. Um, so you would go and, and what, watch every international that Germany play and uh, and then try and get the game started in Switzerland? So I'm flying every year to the um, Griffin Cup, the annual test between Netherlands and Germany. So that's my October holiday. Fixed trip. Starting the game in Switzerland, I'm too old and too injured to play. So <laughs> I'm out of that. <laughs> but I try to help in admi admin stuff. That's where I have my have experience in, in another sport. So I can help there. There are talks about the target is uh, five clubs. Switzerland isn't big and I think that's the maximum for a sport which is not very well known in continental Europe. Now, oh, five clubs close to each other sounds like WF postcode to me. I, uh, <laughs> stop, 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 stop. <laughs> I think the other thing we should establish is what it is that appeals to you, because clearly, um, you know, Richard and I have got a, maybe a, f a family tradition that um, it was an obvious thing to, to, to go and support because maybe fathers, grandfathers down the line had, had, had been there and tradition is a very important part of what's got us to where we are. But what eyes did you watch the sport with? What appealed to you, having come across it as completely new? In the beginning, it was the speed, the physicality, but well, for me, I played uh, ice hockey, so that's something that appeals to me. And the fairness of the players. After 80 minutes, handshake, done. There's no behind-the-back stepping or the, something like that on the field. They are nickly, and there was one or two punches thrown in the uh, 2000s, but... Um, no, in the beginning, it was the physicality and the speed of the game. And uh, through the years, all the fans around it, the fan culture in rugby league is so different to other sports. And what, what's it like compared to German football? Because, again, we're looking at a reshaping of the game. Uh, I, IMG have come in, they're talking about restructuring, re-imaging, um, more commercial value. Um, but the Bundesliga in Germany, from a soccer point of view, fan ownership is very important. Is is that something, again, that you think we might might or should be looking at? The, yeah, it's fan ownership in German soccer is obligatory. So you have to have it. It's not allowed in private ownership, except two, uh, there are two exceptions, which are historical. That's Leverkusen and that's Ingolstadt, which uh, uh, were company sports groups in, in their start. So, but that's the only two. 
Is it possible? Yes, it is. But you need a bigger fan base. You can't do it with a club with 500 people. Or like, let's say, 8,000 people. It will be difficult. When the salary cap is so high, so high, do these air, air quotes, um, that you need a big benefactor to spend money into the club. To find some big benefactors, there's not enough of them around. That's the problem. Uh, yeah, and the one, uh, and the ones that are around, if you really are, you really wanting them? <laughs> <laughs> let, let, let's not go there. Um, <laughs> so let's not upset people. We only just started. You know, I mean, we upset enough people as it is uh, <laughs> without going down that road. How was Batley and Lee yesterday? On on a tangent, talking about the game. Oh, well, all of it, all of it. I mean, have you, have you been to Batley before? Yes. Yeah. So you know all about the famous sloping pitch and whatever else is in Batley. Yes. Biscuits. Yes, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Phil, but, uh, we keep Phil off. Uh, the game was like 50 minutes where Batley were competitive. And after that, it was, you could take the twice game, walk one copy of another, spread the ball fast to the right wing. And run it through. It was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> well, what else are you seeing then in your time over here? What, what, what other matches are you going to? Uh, the first match was on Saturday, North Wales versus Oldham. Pretty much the same. 50 minutes competitive from Oldham. And then their left side de defense collapsed till the 60th minute. And then I think North Wales, uh, yeah. Thought they had it safe with 30 0. And Oldham could, could score a couple of tries. And on Saturday, I was at Cass versus Kara. Well, <laughs> another exciting finish. <laughs> <laughs> Not a very exciting <laughs> close game. <laughs> you, you've picked some great games to go to. And you, you've really planned your, uh, your trip well. well. We're really showing, showing you the best of rugby league here. There is a reasoning for the three games. In North Wales play, uh, played Brett Billsborough, German heritage player. At 4KR played Jimmy Keinhorst, German heritage player. And for Bentley played Ben White, German heritage player. <laughs> I mean, don't go to Henley on Friday because you know, I, 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 want, I want to see one of those teams win uh, and, and with the German heritage. <laughs> I mean, you must, you must be so proud that the, the Combined Nations All-Stars have at least one German in there. Half German, half Scottish, apparently. Tom Johnson. Yeah. Germany's own. If he doesn't get injured. But that, that is true. Yeah. <laughs> or, or signs for somebody else. I mean, as soon as he signs for Leeds or White, I'm not interested then. Catalan. Sorry. Oh, Catalan, that was it, wasn't it? Not Leeds. Catalan. But, uh, not Scott Drinkwater, he plays for the Cowboys. What's uh, Sprouse's name? Josh. 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 So, I mean, at least if, he, if Tom Johnston goes to, uh, goes to the Catalans, I mean, is, that, is that easier to get to from Switzerland than the north of England? Are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, I can hardly find my way around Wigan to Wigan, let alone, you know, anywhere outside of the M62. <laughs> yeah, but that's because you take the train. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, our, our superb trains in the north of England. The Queen's not coming up here to open up a train line, otherwise she'll be about 125 by the time they do. Aha, uh -huh. one, two, five. There you go. I remember those. those. That, that Very good. good. Yeah. Very good. I don't think they ever went that fast, but they were supposed to do. They could have done. I mean, what, what else is doing in Switzerland then? Obviously, the, the, the rugby league is whatever it is there. Is it just football, ice hockey? Is, what, are the, what are the main sports there? Uh, main sport is battling between ice hockey and football. The both big, both very expensive. But there, in a small nation with just eight million people, there is not much space for other sports around. It's all that gold they've got stored. <laughs> uh, I think we changed yep. too much. We, we changed our uh, business concept to money laundering. laundering. 
Now, let's not talk about FIFA. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so it's, safe, it's it's safe to say that um, your memorabilia collection would put most people to shame as well. You were talking about that earlier. Yeah, a couple of balls, some shirts, <clears throat> like 130. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just bought another one today. Uh, <laughs> oh, what have you? What have you bought? Uh, a wine shirt. Oh. I mean, in fairness, they're always on sale, so you know, you're going to get a good deal on. <laughs> At the moment, they're giving them away. You got an England shirt for a tenner. You, you know, fancy one of those? Um, I have one. No, I have two: a training shirt and a uh, game shirt, a replica shirt. But somebody wanted to sell me um, uh, what's the name the, with the red flowers? Oh, the the rugby union one. No, oh, no. The, oh, the the, the one shirt. That, yeah, the oh, one the that commemorated shirt, the First World War. Yeah. And as, it's a, uh, as, a, uh, as a German, that I think that's not a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's all water under the bridge now, you know. You can wear that, <laughs> that's fine, I'm sure. Dear, 130 shirts. I mean, they, they, those NRL ones, they cost a fortune already. I mean, it must cost a fortune to get shipped to Switzerland. You know my addiction is the same as you have, eBay? Yes. I'm trying yeah. to wean myself off it. And I, I don't have many NRL shirts because I, the, for me it's only cowboys there. But I collect these real stupid stuff, things like English amateur clubs, like Leeds. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, no, I think you could get away with that this week. <laughs> shirts from uh, Stellingly East Leeds. I have these uh, suspect American clubs which never play a game. <laughs> it's, it's coming the NARL is coming I'm told I have even elite two French jersey and that was in story I told Philip Phil today oh, Jesus yeah uh, that's the uh, things I try to get and they come from funny places most shirts I buy on eBay come from Portugal or Poland yeah, I don't, I don't know how all these shirts end up in Ukraine. I said they, they end up there as well, but obviously they, they probably don't end up there at the moment. But yeah, they, they seem to have these bunches of random shirts that turn up in Eastern Europe, and I don't know how they get there. No, I, I just bought uh, two East Leeds jerseys in Poland. How in Mik East Leeds? Mikolaj Oledzki, I reckon, something to do with that. He's, <laughs> shif he's shipping them out there. <laughs> Oh, when are we going to get a Swiss player in Super League then? Who's going to be the Swiss Mikolai Alegi? Nah, twenty <laughs> years. If I, if I ever, if I'm still alive to see it. <laughs> so, what do you make of our facilities? Because um, clearly, you were at Batley last night. Um, a very different experience, perhaps, to to go into a, a Super League game. Um, how do we compare to, say, you know, a first or second division? Swiss football team. Uh, first, I would say if I watch uh, Super, I watch a Super League game at Cars and then a Championship game at Betley, and Betley had a better <laughs> ground <laughs> facilities. Uh, number one, uh, no um, stadiums are much more modern. The new stadiums, but I don't like the atmosphere in there. I was at Saints. I was at Le in Leeds. Uh, after the rebuild, and it's some sometimes it's it's a bit sterile. No, and Cass is really good ground to watch games. The atmosphere is really good. I like it there. Bedley is nice. Uh, League One North Wales. It was all them guys made some noise. North Wales guys try to make some noise. But if you have only two chance, that's boring. <laughs> <laughs> I make a couple of friends today. <laughs> we do have North Wales list, uh, fans listening to this program. At least one anyway. So, yeah. apologies, to, good, apologies. Good job you're going home. Yeah. <laughs> you, you didn't fancy taking in that massive game between Cornwall and West Wales. Because like, obviously that was the, the big game of the weekend. Uh, yeah, no. 
that's definitely not as easy to get to as, as, as Catalans. I think that's fair to say. Uh, Cornwall is way off any airport. <laughs> is there anywhere you haven't been that you'd like to see again? Uh, yes, uh, still have uh, Wigan and Warrington in my books and my French tour. Uh, Two-week French tour is, was planned for 2020 and got cancelled for reasons we all know. <laughs> And would you hope to get here for the World Cup? Because again, they they're the kind of events where if you if you're able to spend sort of a week or two weeks here, you'd get a, a, a sort of that international flavour of the sport that I think would fire you up going back to to Switzerland to maybe try and and get something off the ground. It depends on my boss. <laughs> Do we need to write you a letter? <laughs> <laughs> I think that will not help. <laughs> Surely Swiss TV needs to send someone over as a correspondent, surely. I, mean, I, 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 I'm not sure if they even know what rugby league is. I know the German TV knows because they broadcasted the last World Cup. But, well, I mean, they've probably uh, got a deal, deal for this one because they haven't got it in Australia yet, but it'll probably be on German TV. I, mean, I, how, I, how, I haven't read, uh, read anything about it. How hard is it to, to follow Super League? In Switzerland, because obviously I've seen you tweet uh, and our friends from Canada tweets when Sky put out a clip and you can't see it, which is ridiculous. Um, I don't know why they geoblock it. There's probably some technical uh, rights reasons, but I don't know what they are. But how, how easy is it to keep in touch with what's going on here? Uh, tough. <laughs> Let's just, just say there's no, there's no legal, you, no legal way. Oh. To watch Super League on Sky in Switzerland. Maybe we should leave that one there then and not to... Uh... Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's, like the, it's like those bars in uh, in Magaluf you see with, uh, with Sky Sports. How did they get those Sky Sports? What about the Channel 4 games? Do you have access to them? Yeah. or? Yeah. Channel 4 is a uh, free TV channel in Switzerland, BBC2. So I can watch the games there. I, of course, you can watch Our League and... If games on YouTube like Leeds used to uh, stream their reserves games live, especially when they were in Le- uh, at Stanley, so I could can watch that stuff. I watch a lot of French rugby league on YouTube and Facebook, and of course the NRL is so much easier with the app they have now. But their the NRL was streaming their games since 2008 for free on an app called Livestream back then. And they just with Watch NRL, they monetized it. Which is going to be the way ahead, because I'm sure that, again, part of that IMG press release was that Endeavor Streaming will probably take on the uh, Our League content. And I suspect the one thing they'll be looking to do is at some point, monetize it. Any yeah, question? What's the value you can have of, uh, on the deal? The RFL put, I think, seven or eight years ago, they put out a deal for foreign, uh, foreign fans, which came to the same amount as the Watch NRL app, but just with three games live. That's it. So, which team have you nominated when you joined our league? Because you're, you're a fan of so many of them. I wouldn't have <laughs> thought the RFL would have wanted you to put North Queensland Cowboys. Uh, no, I could could have used others, but I uh, did use Bedley. So that'd be a nice couple of quid or whatever Batley will get from that then. I mean, I've, yeah. I've, I've, I've got Midlands as my... You can have two teams. I've got Midlands as my second team. So, I mean, I hope they appreciate that. I mean, at least this weekend. Are, are you, when do you go back to... Uh, tomorrow. Tomorrow. So at least though at the weekend though you can pay four pound ninety five and watch Lee versus Workington on Sunday, which I'm sure will be a, a massively competitive game as second plays bottom in the championship. No disrespect to Workington, but you do get Hulk Hour and Catalan on Channel Four on Saturday. That's more my choice. Uh, I will make because I honestly think uh, five pound for a championship game. Don't think that is a good value especially for fans who don't have any relation to the club. I mean, what would you like from 
Super League. Well, they are, they're all together now. What would you like from the RFL to offer to fans from outside of the United Kingdom in terms of... Because obviously we, there are only a certain amount of televised games until yes. there's lots of money around. They can, I mean, look, in this country, we couldn't get a radio commentary of Toulouse versus Wakefield, the big game at the bottom of the table. So if we can't get that in this country, you know, we're hoping for miracles to get anything uh, outside. But what would you like and how much would you, say, be willing to pay for a product? For me, it's like, I would pay a monthly subscription, let's say 20 quid per month, which isn't bad. It's not less money. I think you'll buy, uh, buy a club in League One for that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, but you have to broadcast more than one game a weekend. What about the quality? I mean, do you need to see multiple camera angles? Do you want a big screen? Um, do you want a commentator and a, and a, a summariser? Yeah. For that uh, £20, what would you expect? Uh, so I, I would expect commentary. That's, of course, but I need, I don't need three cameras or five or in studio or something like that. I mean, I watch games on YouTube from amateur clubs with one camera. And that's okay. But uh, if you pay money, then you need at least commentary on it. And maybe, uh, um, what's in it on? Slow motion. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Slow motion replays. Uh, well, I don't think we managed that when we did the cup final in 2018. I think I think that was beyond our capabilities. So. Only when the Wi-Fi dropped, I think. But um, we did have commentary, at least. And, and I mean, they got some presenters who weren't very good, though. But, I mean... I mean the, the, I was going to say, in terms of the women's game, wheelchair... Um, PDRL, LDRL, does, does all that appeal to you as a passion? I have to I watch the odd women's game. I'm not so into that, but I didn't ha uh, was able to watch a wheelchair game till now. I watched two live games in Featherston in 2019, the Shield and, and Plate Final there, which was good, but it's not that I wouldn't go just for the women's game. But if it was part of your subscription, this £20 a month, would that satisfy yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, of course. It's like, it's, it's about the amount of games you can bring on. I mean, you have clubs like Cornwall, where they pay for their broadcast, more or less. But you also can do stuff like, I can't imagine it costs so much money to do the Bradford, what the Bradford Bulls had on Facebook. It can't be that expensive. Well, knowing how much I got paid for presenting that, it can't have cost that much, no. <laughs> yeah, but you are cheap. <laughs> I am cheap. Uh, some, would say, some would say very cheap, uh, especially some of my former employees in Ripley. League. Probably, actually, some of them would say I got paid too much. But uh, I mean, it, it, it can be done. It can be done. The problem is, is it needs to be of a, a certain standard and... That's, as you say, I mean, you're willing to pay that much and, and you, you want basic coverage, but it still has to be a quality basic coverage. It can't just be someone with a phone no. pointed at a pitch. That's the... That's yeah, the exactly. Uh, it needs a proper camera. Somebody who knows how to deal with it. Well, that not rules you. us out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> In terms of standard, I mean, clearly... I would say your first passion is the NRL and the particular team that uh, that you support over there. But you watch a cross section of rugby league that I think would even put Richard and I to shame. You are the the terminology I think can only be devotee. Um, how, how do you find the standard? Because say we were we were both at Batley last night, and in a way that was disappointing. Um, now that that's no no way uh, to detract in any way from the fine performance that Lee put in, but. It was too one-sided to be enjoyable yes. overall. Um, so how do you find watching a lot of NRL and then comparing that with Super League and then you're interested in French, maybe a Division 2 game, a, a, an NCL match? D does, does quality bother you? Because, again, I'm just trying to get a feel for if I'm IMG asking you the questions and you're my ideal target audience of what the sport should be appealing to, 
what is it that you're looking for and would find acceptable? Even watching the sport now for 16, 17 years. I never played it, so I don't see the, some fine details which you probably see or Richard. For me, a one-sided game is bad because you switch off. So if you have close games, that's always nice. One-sided games are bad, you switch off. Um, on the other hand, if a game is good and exciting, it doesn't have to be uh, a Super League game. It can, it can be an Elite 2 game. It can be an NCL Division 2 game. If it's close, if it's exciting. But you can watch NL games where, where they drop balls like... No, I can't say this. Uh, and that's boring too. Because uh, when you have like completion of uh, 50% and a half, that's nothing nice to watch, even in the NRL, not. And the international game, we, we said a lot, you know, that that should be the pinnacle and calendars should be, um, you know, integrated into, into what we're doing at that. Do you feel sad that we don't put the international game at the top of the agenda? And would you get more interest if you could see, um, you know, the African Championship or qualifying tournaments in Europe through to the next World Cup. Is that what you want as opposed to the club game? Or so, uh, For me, I, w I w will watch these games, of course, because I watch nearly every game I can watch. But uh, for new fans, some people here have to remember when I realized that rugby league was played in the north of England, I knew Leeds and that's it. And Leeds I knew from Leeds United. I hadn't had a clue where Wigan is or St. Helens or, or Batley or Warrington. But everybody knows where Italy is, where the Netherlands are, where Norway is, where Lebanon is, where Cameroon is. It's quite easy for a fan from outside the sport. It's easier to watch an international because you know where, what these countries are instead of uh, small English towns. Sorry. <laughs> I think you're preaching to the converted a little bit here, but um, no, I think it's important again that we talk about consultation. We use that horrible word stakeholders and everybody tends to go to the existing rather than um, the evangelical. And, and I think what, what you might find acceptable and, um, a, a more pleasurable watching experience is something that should be factored into whatever work's being done at the moment to decide what the sport should look like. And that doesn't happen very often, so we shouldn't waste this opportunity to get your opinion. I, I think, again, it's comparable to seeing 10,000 people in Toronto. Forget the financial model of, of how that ultimately ended up. You went from nobody really knew the sport to some passionate fans who went every single week in a, in, a, in a volume that would put a lot of Super League teams to shame at the moment. You're, you're the same in many ways. You, you've almost come across this sport accidentally, uh, been taken to it, fallen in love with it. What we've always said is if people see it, it tends to stay with them. It, it's something that sells itself rather than you have to sell. And I think we need to find out what people like you who are prepared to commit so much to come over and see it, to buy the replica shirts, to, to sit there with five televisions in front of you on the same afternoon watching rugby league from all over the world. You know, you're, to me, you are as important as a diehard six old who's watched their team you know, ever since they were lifted over the turnstiles. Yeah. It's, it's, it's different. As is the taste of fans for the games is different. You have fans who like one-sided scores because it's a lot of attacking football. And then there are fans who like to grind in the defense. There are always two sides. I, I don't want to, to, I'm a nerd. I'm a total rugby nerd, <laughs> rugby league nerd. Sorry. <laughs> and what I hate to see in Toronto is there are 10,000 fans to a game. I think 4,000 were hardcore fans at the end. And these 4,000 fans which I think some Super League clubs would be glad to have, are now there without a sport to follow. 
That's tough. I, I'm pleased to say because I've got the I've got the stats up of the podcast. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming you download it every week. And in the last two weeks in Switzerland, we've had 24 downloads. So I don't know who the other people are in Switzerland. Unless it's people, with, unless it's people with VPNs or something. And I'm putting it through Switzerland for some reason. It, there's, it two, goes, there's two teams there. Yeah, United Kingdom's <laughs> the top. Then Australia, USA, India. We're big in India, apparently. Oh. Canada, Switzerland, Ireland, New Zealand, Spain, Kuwait, and Mexico. I don't know who listens in Mexico or Kuwait, but you know, we thank all our international listeners. As, as tiny as some of those numbers are, twenty-four people in Switzerland. Who are who are the other people? Even if it's even if it's like two episodes, that must be twelve people. And and you're in that twelve. So there's eleven other people in Switzerland that download okay, this uh, podcast. My best mate occasionally comes with me to the UK to watch games, so, so it but might he be doesn't him. listen to podcasts. Oh right, no, it's not. Him. <laughs> We don't know. We don't know. Uh, we're, we're running out of time, Carsten. So thank you very much for joining us. I, mean, I hope you have a safe journey home to Switzerland Thanks. and keep spreading the word. Um, I, unfortunately, um, I did do GCSE German. I mean, I should have probably done French now. There's two teams in Super League and there's no German team yet. Um, but that was 20 odd years ago. And I can't remember any of it apart from uh, the comedy can best and some Bahnhof's bitter, uh, which is not very much use, especially not if you're in Lee. Don't ask that in Lee. Uh, but uh, ha- happy travels, Carson. Thanks for joining us. And I've got some books for you, which if we could have met up, I would have given you, but I had to work today. So I couldn't, but, but I'll bring, I'll, I'll keep them for next time you're here. Okay. Which hopefully will be the World Cup. Hopefully. If not, same time next year. You know, feel free to come back to Wakefield. I don't have any more t shirts that are different, but you know, <laughs> I'll see what I can find in the tub. Uh, Carson, it's been a pleasure. Keep spreading the word and we'll catch up with you again soon. And thank you for listening because, you know, you're one of the people who does. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Uh, I was in Wakefield yesterday. Oh, well, I, don't know. Know. I know. I know uh, why you uh, stay at home the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> Damned with faint praise. <laughs> we've, got, we've got a world leading museum. We've got a, a cathedral. We've got some shops. We've got like the, the Walk of Fame. You see the Walk of Fame? Jim McDonald's on there. I mean, they must, she must be famous in Switzerland, surely. <laughs> Black Lace. <laughs> Chanel from Big Brother. Uh, no. <laughs> the great Martin Kellner. Martin Kellner. Nope. I mean, he's, he's kind of like a refugee in Wakefield. We're taking him from across the penalty. 